Okay, so the way we're going to do this, this is a panel about readers and uh, reading Bukowski. And so we're going to start with uh, us, <laughs> for <a> change, <laughs> uh, meaning us readers, researchers, because we're m first readers and then researchers and then readers again. <laughs> but we're, we're uh, readers, certainly, of course. And, and so uh, we will go by, okay, I'm the oldest, so <laughs> the oldest research, I suppose. Uh, then Dina, then Amélie, because they all did their thesis on Bukowski, a uh, PhD. And then we'll go to the reader's side. Then we'll ask you who are artists, readers, readers, uh, everything, okay? And uh, you can define yourselves as such. So uh, what I can say is that the research that I, that I have been doing for uh, since 84, yeah, since 84, 1984, has been triggered by Bukowski, okay? Uh, because I can't even remember my reading of him, but <laughs> when and how I, fe I fell upon the book, but it was factotum, and I really enjoyed it, and I decided to do my master's thesis on him. And in order to narrow down the topic, I actually chose to do, to treat uh, unrealism in Bukowski's short story. So talk about the, the fiction and talk about the unrealism, <laughs> not the realism, but it, of course it's really mixed. But anyway, so I did my thesis and then I won an award uh, to, it was called the Ritz Hemingway Tocqueville Award <laughs> to do, to make a documentary. And originally the project was I had to like create this project in a, <laughs> very few days because I saw it and then I thought okay I should try and then so it was based on Bukowski it was to make a documentary on the LA poetry scene but based on Bukowski because I had read reading him that there was a poetry scene that he read his poetry aloud which to French people is really uh, pretty unknown okay it's a it's an Anglo-Saxon tradition actually but uh, in France you don't touch poetry you know, uh, you don't read it aloud, and certainly not the poet himself or herself, because it would be, you know, presumptuous. You know, we don't like the I, <laughs> contrary to uh, Americans. <laughs> and so, it, you know, you don't, you should not put yourself forward. Okay, it's bad uh, manners. <laughs> and the poet, it would be presumptuous. It, it, that's the sort of thinking, okay? And also reading the poetry on the page. So I was really fascinated by these poets reading. So about Bukowski, he was speaking, he, he was performing his poetry and, and it was, there was a big thing about him. I mean, there, there was a big audience. So I thought that was kind of uh, intriguing. And then when I went and researched, I saw there were all kinds of poetry readings, all kinds. So I thought I should document that. And so I documented it and I, I made a documentary, an hour and a half, called 10 LA Poets, Innerscapes, which took me, that was a lot of work, I could tell you. <laughs> I did it at UCLA, <laughs> but uh, it was like two years of my life and uh, editing in particular is extremely long. But um, so I did it and then I came back and I chose to do my PhD on the LA poetry scene, which Bukowski is a part of, okay? So this is what I did. So Bukowski has continuously been with me. Uh, he was called the Papa Guru of the scene, so, uh, but, uh, and he still is. <laughs> Here is evidence of it. So, uh, okay, so this, I will let Dina speak about her own uh, journey, Bukowskian journey. Okay, you need to speak to the microphone. Again, we can make it more conversational if you want. So this is, um, um, I have to say I'm a little nervous because every time I made a presentation on Bukowski, it was very academic because you need to, you know, show that you're serious about it for you know, such a author that is not supposed to be so academic, so now I'm actually going the opposite way. And so I wanted to talk about the seemingly contradiction of being a Bukowski scholar. Uh, and you know what, and 
the, a bit uh, earlier with Emily, we said that we were sort of on the margin as Bukowski scholars, not just because we're women, but because we research Bukowski. And that's both on the academic side and also on the fandom side. Um, side. So let's, let me give you an anecdote for the, about the, ac um, the academic side. So I don't know if, I, I think some of you know who Marjorie Perloff is. Extremely famous. I was lucky to have met her briefly when I was teaching at UC Irvine. I was at UC Irvine from 2014 to 2018, best years of my life. Uh, so at some point I met her and she asked me, oh, um, are you a PhD candidate? And I said, yes, what are you writing about? I'm writing about Bikowski. And she was like, oh. <laughs> it's a very typical reaction. Um, and after that, she was she politely asked me, "So, what are you writing about about his work?" And I said, uh, "The working title is the embodied voice, um, the, po the poetics of presence in Charles Bukowski's work." And suddenly she was like, "Oh, okay, that sounds like you know more serious, more academic." So like the reaction. So basically, in the academic wor uh, words, you say you write about Bukowski. You need to sort of prove yourself that you're actually doing serious work about his poetry. On the other hand, um, I think you all know how Bikowski despised the criticism and academia. So I have a few quotes from my PhD, basically, where Bikowski says, um, no, I have, I have no idea why I'm a writer. No, my writing has no particular meaning that I know of. He also says, it's very difficult to explain to people that I'm right and then I'm done with it. They keep going over what I wrote and saying, you meant this and you meant that. And I have to tell them, no, I didn't mean that at all. So it probably would have made a greater story. So the, so the very idea of being a critic of his work is already contradictory. And you might wonder, am I betraying his work by being a critic of his work? Uh, so I want to talk about the fandom, especially, so this, um, so Ronnie is going to talk about it later, I think, the, Bik the famous Bikowski forum, where you have all these like very hardcore Bikowski fans. Um, and I remember, so I met Ronnie many years ago already, and you told me, you know, you should go on that forum because you have people who know very much about Bikowski and his work. It's a, like a, it's a very good resource and you need to get in touch with these people. And you told me, just make sure you say it, you come on my behalf. Because you know, if you come up to that forum and you say, okay, I um, want to be Bikowski scholar, please help me on this, they would be like, you know, th so there's this natural distrust from the fans of Bikowski, you know, towards people who, are, who want to have an intellectual approach of his work. And in a way, you have to prove that, okay, you might want to you know write about his work but but basically you're still a fan and a reader of Bukowski if you want them to take you seriously so that was something very important um, I'm going to tell you now about um, how I became a reader of Bukowski and the yesterday we mentioned you know how it, whether it was possible to know Bukowski without knowing the person and I think I was pretty lucky that I started reading him before knowing who he was. So what happened is that, um, so I, I, was, uh, I studied English in France, and during my third year, I decided that I wanted to specialize in poetry. Uh, we had a class about Emily Dickinson, and I realized, okay, I was always a literature nerd, but I thought if I want to, um, where, so if I want to work in literary, um, literary critics, I want to focus on poetry. I love looking into details, cracking codes, and so on. Uh, so my teacher at that time, my future advisor, Elena G, actually gave me a list of poets that I could look into. Charles Bukowski was merely a name in the list. So I read a few of these poets. I, she re-insisted on Gertrude Stein, and I thought, I'm not sure I want to spend many years reading and analyzing Gertrude Stein, so I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, and I remember I, I borrowed, like, I borrowed uh, a, a bunch of uh, Bukowski poetry books from the American Library in Paris, and I was retaken really by it. 
like um, it was like a reader's experience, not a critic's experience. Um, maybe this is something that other people have felt, but I felt that his writing was very grounding. And I remember Pamela Woods in her memoir said that as a person, Bukowski was a very grounding person, and this is really what I felt in his poetry, what I still feel. I still read his poems in dark times. So that was my first experience reading it, but I thought it doesn't look like the kind of poetry that you want to write a master thesis on. So at first I thought, okay, I'm still going to look, I'm still going to look, and later it just became obvious, like I really love his poetry, and if I want to you know, focus one or several years of my life on someone's poetry, it's going to be his. And I did my first master, master thesis on, on him, the second one, and then, eight years of PhD. That was a, a very long time, I realize. Um, so uh, when I did that, I was confronted to an impossible challenge. So my first master's thesis was, it was around 2004. Oh my God, 20 years ago. Don't think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, were there many books on Bukowski 20 years ago? Um, depends what kind of books. Uh, the critics were mostly biographical critics. There were hardly any books that would really go into like rereading the text and trying to f like, write about the writing. Uh, most people would end up write, writing about his life rather than his writing, and the problem is that in France, there's this very strong tradition of close reading, and whatever I had to write, it had to be close reading, and I had nothing to refer my to refer to. So my first master thesis, I was a baby researcher. It took me two years to find an approach to be, you know, to analyze his poetry, but still be faithful to that. You don't want to make Bukowski like to make him say what he didn't want to say, but you still want to. No, write about his writing. I'm, I'm not going to dwell on the approach I took, but it was mostly based on the body, on the poetics of presence, about you know this ground. So it was based on my feeling too, the, this grounding feeling. Why, when you read his poems, you feel that you're sitting next to him? Why do you feel that you hear his voice? That you're like you can hear the the typewriter as he's writing the poem. Like I was really fascinated by that, and I try to maybe, you know, somehow grapple this mystery in my, in my writing. Um, and I'm going to finish this presentation by, no, I'm not totally finished, sorry. <laughs> but what I want to say is that researching Bukowski, reading Bukowski, all of them are always intertwined with life. So before Bukowski, writing and life were, they're almost the same. They cannot be separated. And I think if you're a reader and, a res and also a researcher, at some point, it, get, it gets mingled with your life. The most, maybe the, the most, imp so I spent many years on his poetry, and maybe the most important part was, sorry, the fact that I spent four years in Southern California navigating the LA poetry scene, just like Sophie D did. And it was, it was fantastic, and you know, I was, I'm not a poet, but, as a wannabe Bukowski scholar, I was able to, you know, to go to poetry readings, to meet so, some poets. Like I met, I met Mike um, indirectly. We have like some friends in common. It reopened a new world to me. Thanks, you know, to being um, thanks to Bukowski. Uh, not to mention that people who live in LA, many of them do read Bukowski. I haven't met many French people who read Bukowski or his poetry. But in Los Angeles, like I remember like so many bartenders who would be like, oh my god, I love Bukowski, send me some poems. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I met a, a lot of friends um, be, like, through Bukowski as well. And I think the most rewarding part as a scholar, like so something, like a bridge I had as a scholar that was very rewarding to me as a reader, was to have access to the archives. So to have access to the manuscript, especially the unpublished manuscripts, like you need an official status as a scholar. And oh my God, I, especially the archives um, at UC Santa Barbara. They, so Bukowski had donated many 
poems. So I call them the early poems. I am a huge fan of the, the poems he wrote at the beginning of his career. They were um, very different to most of the poems that are published currently. They were less narrative. They were very metaphorical. They are very emotional. A lot of intricate images, very powerful in my opinion. And when I went to Santa Barbara, I, I was able to see so many of these poems that were never published. And I don't know if most of you were there at the coffee shop yesterday, but that's what, so I read a poem from these archives that is my favorite poem, but was never published. It was, so for those who weren't there, it, it's a poem where Bukowski is trying to um, persuade his friend or maybe himself not to commit suicide. And as I said, I had some friends who told me that this poem saved their lives. So I wanted to finish on another anecdote to, you know, further prove how being a, like how Bukowski is always, like Buk reading Bukowski, researching Bukowski, everything is always intermingled with life. So I'm going to finish on that. Um, Mike, do you know King Eddie? The bar. The bar? On 5th Street. Hmm? On 5th Street. Yep. So I used to hang out a lot there. He, it's a Bukowski <laughs> bar, right? Like a Bukowski bar. Um, so there was one day, so my friend Rosie that I mentioned yesterday, um, so I was living in Irvine and I had a really, really bad day. She had a really, really bad day and she said, come over to LA, we're going to go bar hopping. So I went there and in my backpack, I had copies of manuscripts from the Santa Barbara archive, including that poem. Uh, that poem that I mentioned, so we went to a couple of bars and then we finished at King Eddie and there were a bunch of people, uh, typical Angelino hipster, uh, like you don't know if they are hipsters or punk. Uh, there was this tall guy I was talking to, he had his face full of tattoo, he had the word renard tattooed over his forehead and when I told him, oh that means fox in French, he was he got like, oh my God, that's incredible that you know that. Yes, because I'm French, that's, that's, that's <laughs> all I know. And then I told him, oh yes, in my backpack, I have some Bukowski manuscript. And he was like, you should put it away. This is, this is, even, this is even more precious than expensive Coke. <laughs> um, I felt very special. <laughs> um, so, you, so you know, like with those, um, this group of you know strangers, I was able to bond over Bukowski. So it was a huge group of friends um, in like one group that was over the bar. And I remember in the corner there was one, one of the women was crying uh, softly. So you know, like me and Rosie, we we bonded with the Renard guy, with uh, some other people. And there was this woman I was talking to. We talked about Bukowski, and. Um, at some point she went out to smoke a cigarette and I had this urge, like sometimes you have these like intuition, these urges that have no, re there's no reason for that. I, I joined her outside like while she was smoking and I said, I have this poem, I think for some reason I think you would like to read it. So the suicide poem, I, I showed it to her and she started looking very emotional and she said, this is so relevant. Can I take a picture of it? I said, well, don't post it on social media if it's just for yourself and if it makes you feel good. Okay, you can take a picture. And I could see she was on the verge of tears and you know, this woman who was crying earlier, she was outside and she, she was surrounded by people consoling her. So what I understood a bit later that evening is that these people gather to pay tribute to their friend who used to be a bartender at King Eddie and she had committed suicide the week before. And this is another reason why this poem was very special to me and uh, you know, I was able to, as a scholar, to have access to this very special poem, and all the special poems too, but this one too, like uh, being a scholar was allowed me to have access to this poem and help people through their pain. And I was very honored to have been able to do that as a scholar, a reader, and a fan. Thank you very much.
I'm gonna be a lot shorter than that because <laughs> I didn't know I was gonna speak now. <laughs> so, um, hi, Amelie. <laughs> I think um, you all know me by now. Uh, and yeah, so how I got to read and research Bukowski is not as, uh, I feel like it's not as interesting as you. <laughs> but yeah, so I started not with, not through poetry, but through prose uh, and uh, in French, because my uh, some family members w were reading uh, Bukowski to me uh, when I was a teenager, and they just found some parts that were funny and they would read it uh, to me. So um, it wasn't about <laughs> suicide, obviously. <laughs> I guess. Uh, or I just really didn't, didn't understand uh, what it was about, but uh, yeah. I find it interesting that uh, in this panel where the three scholars are uh, female and the two readers are uh, male, so that was just something I, I, I wrote down here. But yeah, so uh, Bukowski was yeah, I discovered him in my uh, teenage years, and um, I rediscovered him uh, when I was in 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 Reading, uh, trying to figure out what to do with my life. <laughs> and I feel like uh, he always comes around <laughs> when this happens, right? Um, yeah. So I just read, uh, I just um, bought a few of his books um, at a bookstore and then I started reading and I read Post Office I think in one night and I just had forgotten how funny and how just I don't know how alive it made me feel to read it and so some of my roommates at the time were like what why were you reading <laughs> like why were you laughing so like so loud about like in your room on your own <laughs> I was like okay um but yeah so then i i was i was considering uh writing a well uh, writing doing a phd and i thought well this is the guy <laughs> and uh yeah so this is just how it happened just randomly uh, rather than through my master's thesis. I, uh, and I think that you were lucky to have um, your advisor giving you, giving you that, you say he was merely a name in the list, but he was a name, you know, on the list. Yes. And it's, I think it's special because I don't think that most advisors would have uh, in France would have given you Charles Bukowski's name as a uh, reading list. Um, and yeah, when I s first talked to my advisor about him, I was thinking about actually with, uh, so it, it's relevant to Grégory because it's, uh, I was thinking about so doing something with Fante Bukowski and then, um, and then I just uh, focused on uh, Bukowski and his publishing, uh, his publishing, his image and his reception. Um, so. I went away from the text to look at the people who helped him become who he became, uh, in a way. And uh, this is what uh, you talk about, uh, meeting people through Bukowski, and I studied how Bukowski did create this, um, this circle around him, right? And uh, this is also something that Sophie mentioned, right? Because you knew people who knew Bukowski, and, everybody knows uh, one another through him. So I think that was um, relevant to my speech right now. <laughs> um, yeah, my master's thesis was about um, Nathaniel Hawthorne. So that's a little bit ir irrelevant <laughs> here. Uh, but uh, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so I looked also at the publishing in France, how he was translated. Um, at the paratext and uh, the photo like the photographers, I'm interested in uh, everything that surrounds uh, him and how he created or how he they created the image uh, of Bukowski. And I think it's I think it's uh, time for me to stop. <laughs> but yeah, so basically that was it for me. Uh, yeah, I think. I, get, I mean, oh, okay. Uh, but yeah, I think that either way, I think that I was mostly done. Uh, the train. Oh, 
Yeah, yeah. Hi. Well, sorry. <laughs> you don't have to. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Yes. No. 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 I was going to say you'll just have to look at the recordings. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Um, but yeah. So I think. But yeah. 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 I will be done now. Thank you very much. <laughs> So uh, before we leave the floor to the readers, readers, <laughs> um, um, not exactly reader, reader, actually, but <laughs> yeah, I, when you were saying a circle of people around him, and it's true that uh, Red Stodolsky, who was a bookstore owner in Los Angeles and who was a friend of Bukowski's, and when you're saying circle of people, he was among them. And really, actually, it makes me think that there was a circle of love around him actually to protect him like I, I think Joan is like that too uh, you know people who feel really strongly and uh, <laughs> protect them so protect him and and I know Red who was the bookstore owner he gave me so many books I mean he really because he I, I suppose he saw, he saw that it was genuine interest and and uh, and uh, he tried to help those who tr who really had a genuine interest so but anyway, so as a reader too, so. Yes, you have a microphone. So. Oui, et puis sur des formes de questions, quelque chose d'ouvert que. Parce que. Mais c'est que après, Pauline va va en parler dans. Elle, elle, euh, oui, oui, oui. C'est bon, vous m'entendez euh, Donc, euh, sorry, I speak French. Euh, ma première expérience, eh moi, c'était quand j'avais 14 ans, en pleine euh, adolescence. Donc, euh, en étant dans cette, on va dire, période de ma vie, ça m'a subjugué par la moi je vais dire par la brutalité de l'écriture en fait. J'ai trouvé ça très brut et en fait c'était en accord avec ce que j'écoutais comme musique. Euh, du punk rock, trash metal, Slayer, Sepultura, Pantera. Et euh, c'était au début des années 90. Donc moi, pour moi, Charles Bukowski fait partie entièrement de la contre-culture française et généraliste. Quoi. Parce qu'en fin de compte... Euh, comme ça a été dit depuis hier, c'est quelqu'un de libertaire, d'anarchiste, mais qui ne l'a jamais dit. Et je pense qu'individuellement, ça a touché beaucoup, beaucoup, beaucoup de monde. Voilà, et c'est grâce à mon frère que j'ai pu avoir accès à, à cette lecture. Mon premier livre, c'est « Je t'aime, Albert », en révisant mon, mon brevet des collèges, en fait. Voilà, après, ben après on s'en suit... Ben, euh, ouais, ben, Bukowski me suit tout au long de ma vie. Je travaille dans le vin depuis 30 ans. J'ai beaucoup bu. J'ai eu des expériences euh, assez folles avec l'alcool, tout en pensant toujours à lui, en ayant de réfléchir, en étant sous, en, en allant de bar en bar, en côtoyant des punks, à toujours m'approcher au plus près de lui, hein, finalement. Quoi. Mais aujourd'hui, bon, ben, voilà, j'ai changé, je prends de l'âge, j'ai tout arrêté. Mais euh, ouais, il fait partie de moi entièrement. Quoi, hein. C'est grâce à lui que j'ai grandi, hein, entre guillemets, quoi, entre ce côté libertaire, euh, punk et anarchiste. Voilà. Ah oui, moi, j'en ai déjà parlé ce matin, donc euh, ça n'a pas changé. <rire> euh, j'ai rien préparé pour cette table ronde, mais pour en venir sur le côté anarchiste, puisque moi, j'avais mis l'anarchiste hein, sur la présentation, c'est parce qu'en fait, vraiment, je pense que il y a autant d'anarchistes qui, enfin, autant, comment dire, d'anarchie différente qu'il y a, qui a d'anarchistes. Pour moi, euh, Bukowski, c'est justement l'absence de dogme, Donc, que ce soit au niveau euh, littéraire, que ce soit au niveau de vivre, il n'y a pas euh, un protocole déjà établi dès, dès l'enfance. D'ailleurs, dans ses bouquins, il, il le reproche aux gens qui, qui ont tout de suite 
euh, une, comment dire, une, une image de la vie qui les attend. Euh, lui, on, on en a parlé hier, hein, c'était... Euh, le premier intervenant hein, qui disait que se lever le matin à 6h30 pour passer sa vie dans des transports en commun, passer euh, 20 minutes à trouver une place de parking, des choses comme ça, c'était pas pour lui. Enfin, ça n'avait pas de sens et là-dessus, je le rejoins. On passe euh, par exemple notre vie dans, dans des voitures on... et c'est totalement d'actualité. Hein. Je pense que Bukowski, depuis qu'il a écrit ses bouquins, on le relit aujourd'hui. Il y a plein de choses qui sont, bah, comme les, les philosophes grecs, je pense que c'est des choses qui sont euh, intemporelles. Même si c'est fortement ancré dans, dans les années 70, euh, les années 80, je pense que vraiment Bukowski peut se lire à tout moment. Et euh, si on, on, je pense qu'on peut s'y retrouver. Il y en a qui vont vraiment euh, dire qu'ils ne s'y retrouvent pas. Ou, ou le côté peut-être un peu... Enfin, mon ex-femme disait souvent que c'est ce, qu euh, ce que j'avais essayé de la convertir, comme tout bon prosélytiste. Et en fait, je crois que c'est le côté, j'en ai parlé ce matin, mais le côté violent, brut. Euh, ouais, peut-être que c'est... C'est quelque chose qu'on n'est pas habitué ou on ne supporte pas. Euh, même son... enfin, le fait qu'il qu emploie des mots grossiers, des choses comme ça. Je pense qu'en effet, faut... moi, je ne vois pas ça comme une preuve de, de gros... Enfin, pour moi, ce n'est pas de la grossièreté. Vraiment, c est, c est... il s'exprime comme il est. On parlait de l'animalité. Enfin, vraiment, il est humain avec euh, ses, ses bons côtés, les mauvais côtés. Et je pense que Bukowski, c'est vraiment l'auteur qui, qui fait qu'aujourd'hui, j'ai vraiment des difficultés à rentrer dans, dans, chez d'autres auteurs où je ne sens pas ce côté brut de... Enfin, sincère. C'est vraiment ce côté-là. Et, euh, et qui parle ou qui ne parle pas. Et c'est clair que toutes les, les personnes qui se revendiquent de Bukowski, même les artistes, hein, sont, sont toujours une part un peu... Euh, alternative, hein, enfin, ou alors euh, dérangeant. Enfin, je pense à Romain Duris, l'acteur, qui, qui a écrit un... qui a fait un bouquin, de, parce qu'il est peint également, qui s'appelle Pulp, le, le bouquin, où il a fait deux livres, où il s'inspire de Bukowski, mais c'est sur de la peinture. Fin. Et, et je pense que lui, bah, c'est pareil, il a une histoire, enfin bon, si on s'y intéresse un peu. Et tous les artistes qui se revendiquent sont un peu dans la contre-culture, dans le côté un peu punk. Je pense qu'on entend, dans les Red Hot Chili Peppers, il y a une référence à Bukowski euh, sur un titre, hein, sur... Euh, le Give It Away d'ailleurs, c'est le titre. Euh, Axel Rose des Guns N' Roses, il mettait un t-shirt Bukowski. Mais bon, là, c'était plus pour la, la frime. Mais, mais on voit vraiment que les artistes qui se revendiquent de Bukowski sont quand même toujours à la marge. Alors, après, voilà, ça peut être aussi, euh, ça peut être aussi récupéré. Parce qu'il y a quand même une pub Levis qui a repris l'un de ses, ses plus beaux poèmes il y a quelques années. Hein. Donc, euh, c'est vraiment. Euh, enfin, c'est comme les clashs qui avaient été repris aussi par Levis. Hein, donc. Euh donc voilà, donc moi c'est ce qui me plaît chez cet auteur, c'est pour ça que quand j'ai su qu'il y avait ce colloque, ça m'a vraiment intéressé d'y participer, même si je n'intervenais pas, je pense que je serais peut-être venu aussi. Et c'est un peu en discutant ce qu'on qu s'est demandé, pourquoi il voilà, euh, n'y a pas des personnes même extérieures à l'université qui se sont emparées de, la, de ce colloque pour être présent, même pour s'intéresser, poser des questions Parce que là on est un peu entre bukowskistes, on est tous convertis. Et c'est très intéressant, hein. moi ça m'a permis de faire des rencontres avec des personnes que je ne connaissais pas encore il y a 48 heures. Mais, euh, mais c'est clair que je pense que c'est un auteur, et en plus est, il est vraiment euh, en France, associé toujours à cette émission qui fait qu'il euh, y en a, ils vont être intéressés pour aller y jeter un oeil, et d'autres euh, bah, qui vont se contenter de, de cette anecdote euh, sordide euh, dans une émission. La littérature, c'est vraiment euh, le lecteur, c'est le lire, c'est peut-être pas... Je comprends son, sa réaction, il, il a dû dire « qu'est-ce que je fous là, au milieu ?» Mais en même temps, on ne l'avait peut-être pas bien briefé, son éditeur est, est responsable également. Mais, mais la, 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 enfin, en fait, il faut, faut le lire. Et après, on peut en sortir des théories comme on veut. Mais en tout cas, voilà, je pense qu'il faut le lire.